Hi everyone and welcome to this special edition of From Inspiration to Stage, Composer Spotlight. Just letting you know that this uh, particular interview was recorded over Zoom and so occasionally we get a few dropouts but it doesn't spoil the great content that our very special guest has got to talk about. So sit back, relax and please enjoy From Inspiration to Stage, Composer Spotlight. All right, so welcome to this special podcast of From Inspiration to Stage. My name is Drew Lane, and we have a very, very special guest with us today. We have the wonderful Vicky Larnack with us. Give her a big round of applause. Yay! Welcome, Vicky, to the podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Drew. I'm freezing. It's winter, but I love it. I like winter. Makes me creative, so... Um, and I'm excited to talk to you. Great. Well, let's get straight into it. Um, how did you get into musical theatre? What was the starting point for you? Uh, ooh. Well, I think I've been doing it all my life, really. Um, I've always been involved in the theatre, always either playing for pantomimes or acting in them or something. Um, and overseas, I did a lot of theatre, music, but I was a rock chick jazz chick played for all the bands um I played for a pantomime with Bert Newton I think I was so long 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 ago at the state theatre <laughs> but um seriously into music theatre was when um my best friend died and I oh. realized you know what you have to do what you really want to do and I, I said, well, music theatre, seriously, not just mucking about, you know, with a band doing little, you know, sort of story music sets, but, you know, doing real music theatre. So that's when I seriously got into it. And that was only about 10 years ago. So obviously you've come from a performance background. Did you think about going into a performance, like actually becoming a professional performer in musicals, or was it a, a, a very deliberate decision to go into writing? Um, definitely writing um, composition because I had little kids at the time and, um, you know, I hadn't been performing for a few years with them. I, I just sort of, no, nah, I'm not going out doing gigs. I'm just, you know, going to stay home and compose. And that uh, and that worked in pretty well. Although I did audition for NIDA many, many years ago when I really thought I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't. <laughs> So you, you say you've only been, you've been, when I say only, 10 years is quite a long time yeah. to be composing for, but you've been composing for about 10 years. What is it about composing for musicals and music theatre that really attracted you to it? Look, it's the excitement of the, the storytelling and, uh, you know, the music with the visual, because I'm such a visual person, so all of my music composition all my life, and I really have been composing since I was about four years old, have always been with a with a picture in mind, you know, you know, <laughs> it's always the visual with the music. So, yeah. um, you know, it's very logical to me to, to, to want to do music theatre. Oh, excellent. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about the uh, project that has been all over social media. The, the one that has really sort of brought your name uh, to the forefront, which is the adaptation of Good Omens. Now you've taken this book and we, we've recently seen, uh, I think it's a new television adaptation as well. So it's, it's out there in the public eye. What was it about that story? What was it about the book that really grabbed your creative attention? It was just so, it, it was just so huge. And the message that it had was one about, I guess it was, it was really in the end saving the earth and, and, you know, the forces between good and evil and, and the balance. But when I was reading the book, I just could see it on stage. I could just see these, these, all these larger than life characters. I think because it's larger than life, that's what mm. sort of made me think, Oh, I'm going to just write to, to them and see if I can adapt that into a musical. You know, I wasn't terribly serious about it because you don't hear back from these important <laughs> writers 
ever. Yep. And, you know, yep. I ended up with a, um, w- with a, a, a meeting with Sir Terry Pratchett in Sydney because he happened to be in Sydney. He said, we don't want a musical because we're making a TV series. We don't want a musical, but come and say hello. And what was supposed to be like a, you know, a 15-minute meeting ended up being, you know, a couple of hours with Sir Terry Pratchett. And, uh, and he, I'd written a song in that time. I, that was The Chattering Nuns. Uh, song and he listened to it and he loved it he said you know what I think you get it you know the hippies because uh, Jim Hare my husband came on <laughs> on it with me and you're the hippies you get it yes, if Nick says yes you can have six months to um, to write uh, you know half a dozen songs in a first draft libretto wow so, then so- on. So six, <laughs> six months, that's, that's, I mean, look, you know, that's a, a certain amount of time. It's a good amount of time. But did, if, did you feel like you were pressured at that point? It's like, okay, we, I wasn't expecting this and, oh, well, okay, we've got to do this now. It was, it was so much pressure because I'd heard that with Terry Pratchett, if he says no once, you cannot go back. That's mm. it. You've yeah. lost your chance. And so we didn't know. First of all, we had to adapt the book, and it, it was it was a monster to adapt. Um, yes. Really difficult. So many characters, so many plot points, which all culminate together at the end, which is fine in a book because you're jumping here and there. You can have chapters here and there, but for it to to adapt it for a two and a half hour stage production was yeah. really hard. And then the uh, not knowing what style and not knowing how cheeky to be, or you know, you just, it, yeah, it was frightening actually. <laughs> Did you did you um, feel like you had some sort of license in like if if certain like you mentioned uh, when you're taking a book it's like when you adapt it to a film there are certain things that change that you know are some sort of creative license is taken did you feel like you had that freedom to have some creative license or did you feel you had to stick very much to the book at that point we didn't feel we felt we had no license you know let's just try and keep it as close to the book as we possibly can. And then, you know, with, with the, as the years went by and they liked what we did because we just had to keep sending stuff through and then, they'd, you know, and, and then wait for them to approve, you know. But they never said, no, we don't like anything. They, they always um, were just like, yeah, okay, keep going, you know, keep going. And the, and the uh, what it was was you put it on yourselves, go ahead, do it. We'll come to Australia and see it and then we'll let you know if you can carry on and uh, of course Terry Pratchett died and uh you know it was it was uh that was very sad um Mm. and you know it was Neil it was very hard to get Neil and and everything coordinated to do a performance and the money and the whole it was just this whole big thing that was so hard to get together the timing of when they could see it but we were very lucky um we, we had an Australia Council grant to do a first reading and then we had, um, and then Merigong uh, Theatre down in uh, Wollongong uh, gave us um, three weeks of their small theatre oh, and wow. some stuff and everything yeah. to, to help to develop it. So that's when we filmed it because by this time we'd got, we brought in J. James Moody because Jim and I, I was riding with my husband yeah. and uh, – <laughs> we were having so many arguments. <laughs> you know, our kids were saying to us, you know, other parents argue about, you know, real life things, but you argue about what chord you're going to play or, or you know, what, where's the comma going or, you know, it's just like just so silly stuff we were arguing about. But anyway, we brought J. James Moody in as a third writer and he, uh, and it was great. He settled us all down <laughs> and then we had a, Right, we had a triumvirate. We had a three, three wheelers, and it was really good. And um, so, what happened was we went through different stages of development, and then filmed this three-day development uh, performance in uh, Wollongong in Marigong Theatre. And uh, and Jim filmed it. We had nine cameras or something, and edited wow. up this beautiful version, which we took to. Uh, Terry, uh, not Terry, Terry's assistant, Rob Wilkins, who is mm-hmm. the most beautiful guy on the planet. Um, he's Terry's manager and, uh, and assistant. And, and so we met with him and Neil Gaiman in a, on a screening room in Soho in, in London and showed wow. them the, the finished product and they absolutely loved it. So um, that was 
amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did Terry Pratchett get to like hear it? Like, did you get any feedback from him in that developmental process over the over that time at all before he passed away? Yeah, he he loved he he really loved where we were going with it. In fact, he surprised us one night with a, a Skype call, and we were, we were in bed and in our pajamas, and suddenly the the Skype's ringing, and it's Terry Pratchett, and and he was telling us how much he loved it, and uh, he was really excited about it. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So that that's... was yeah, that made us happy. So you um you mentioned like obviously you're working with your husband Jim and you know the, the, there is the creative tension that is there which is always good creative tension is good it it brings things in and then you brought in your third person as well how did you find that collaborative process like you mentioned that there was creative tension was there ever a point where you weren't able to find a solution or were you able to generally work your way through we had the most amazing collaboration i, I it, it just gelled as magical i mean you know we would have sometimes we'd disagree so then we'd find a way to make each opinion work or or we had this rule if two out of the three thought it should go ahead we'd, we'd take the majority rule and uh and you know I learned a lot about collaborating because you know I had to throw a lot of babies out you know yeah, so to speak as we do yeah um, yeah and uh and that that was great for me to to learn to to let go for the good of the mm. of the work and um no, we just had a lot of fun together. We it, it's, a, it's a match made in having heaven. I really hope we can uh, collaborate again. So, um, what is the future for Good Omens? What's happened next? Obviously, you've had a successful um, showing of you know the video that you created. You've managed to workshop it in Wollongong. And shout out to Wollongong. I know a few people down there, uh, or up there from me. What's next? What is next for the project? Look. All I can say is stay tuned. I can't, it, it, with COVID, uh, it's just, everything's unknown. Um, I know there'll be some kind of future for it, but I can't, everything's unknown. But the word is stay tuned. Well, I think this is a perfect opportunity to actually have a listen to one of the songs from Good Omens. Would you like to introduce it, Vicky? So Good Omens is basically about Armageddon and the race to try and stop it. And in this song, one of the characters, Anathema Device, who's been following her ancestors' prophecies, which lead her to this little country town where Armageddon is about to start. So she's uh, making fun of everyone in this village in a way because she knows that everyone's going to die, uh, but they're all just innocently being silly. So it was this really fun tongue-in-cheek ensemble number. Perfect place to die. Apples on a chest. What a perfect place to hear the tortured cries of souls about to fry. Fresh bannocks. When the earth explodes in the sun. Blood and guts, I'll say the first goodbye. Goodbye. This is the perfect place to die. <laughs> Have a bannock on my house, Anathema. You're a bannock. Oh. How you settling in, dearie? None of your business, Mrs. Henderson. Lovely daffodil for a lovely lady. No, thanks. You'll be needing it for your grave. Oh, my. What a perfect place to reside. Yeah, for three more days. What a perfect place to live your life. The perfect day, the perfect sky. The perfect bow, the perfect tie. The perfect peace, the perfect shepherd's pie. If they only knew we're all What a perfect place to die. The girls are on one. How about a healthy green smoothie bowl? Hell no. I'll have a green bun and a clear and one of those deep fried sugary donuts and that whole chocolate mud cake, you know, for later. Oh. What a perfect place. She has no bones. Yeah, you've got great cheekbones. What a crazy loon who lurks around tonight and mutters to the moon. She communes with nature. Oh, she communes with the marbles in her mind. Dress like that, you'll never find a guy. Anathema, it's your lucky day. The day you get a date with me. Oh, fuck off, Gaston. This is the perfect place. We are a very happy town. We don't want anyone who's not like us to stay. Because we like the way things are. Things are perfect as they are. Just the way they are. Oh, you take turns being the village idiots. That girl has gone too far. Earthquake, tsunami. I saw 
Maggots by you through maggots its head and in the dead of night. And she catches frog feathers right to use them as her second song. I heard her howling in the forest. She a weirdo. With a cat in a cave in a house. With an ape. This is the perfect place to die. She's not quite right. She's very strange. Place to die. She reads those magazines. I enjoy her speaking This is perfect. And that was the incredible Olivia Vasquez on lead vocals. Vicky, let's go back to what we were talking about, about COVID. Um, have you found that that's been a challenge to you as a creative person? For me, it didn't change much for me because I always stay home and write. And <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, though, I was, I've managed to be incredibly creative. I, I felt I was released from that uh, corral of... Um, of, of, of working on Good Omens where everything had to be according to someone else's work, so to speak. And uh, so now my creativity has gone crazy. And uh, so I wrote a play in November and managed to workshop it during COVID with oh, um, through well the Hope Initiative. And it was just amazing. I had the most incredible cast of eight people and we'd meet once a week on um uh, you know the social the I'll say Zoom. I'm not supposed to mention Zoom. Probably no, <laughs> nah, it's fine. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, and I managed to to end up with the most beautiful um, draft of a play that uh, I hope has a future. So it's called The Water Code. Oh, very good, very yes. good. Do you have another musical in mind? Are you working on something new? Obviously, you don't have to give away too many details, but are there a few new projects in the pipeline? Yeah, I'm working on another one as well, and it's all about dementia, and it's called Ooh. Upstairs for Dancing, and uh, it's probably going to be a quite a challenging one because you know I've been doing a lot of research about um, dementia, and and my interest in that is where does the you that is you, your essence, your soul almost, go when your brain malfunctions? Wow. And so it's an interesting um, story. It's ultimately a love story, but it's about all of it. It happens in a, in a dementia village. Wow. That's certainly yeah. a side. That's certainly a big departure from Good Omens. That's for sure. I guess I was influenced by Sir Terry Pratchett because he had dementia and uh, it, it was a certain type uh, of dementia. I won't, I don't know the technical term for it but he lost his visual um capacity first and he couldn't see the typewriter uh oh. but he still had all the stories in him yeah so yep. he kept writing and writing and writing almost to the end with his assistant rob wilkins who who would who knew him so well that could interpret what he was trying to say and edit it into uh work so I, I, that fascinated me and uh, I started writing a song um, actually when I was visiting Terry in um, in Salisbury and we were in a hotel on a river and, and I started to write this beautiful song about Terry because he said in one of our, um, we, we had lunch with him and he said, um, you know, I used to be Terry Pratchett, I used to be this and so I was just, I wrote a song called I Used To Be Me and, mm. um, and uh, yeah, on the banks of the river where near where Terry lived. So, Well, let's have a listen to that song that you've just spoken about. This is I Used To Be Me. I used to be me, I used to be grand. I used to know what was in I used to be loved Damn, this embuggerance Has got me unplugged My 
My hand is a hat, a duck is a cat. The cat wears a hat, my hand on her back. Stroking the cat that's a duck with a hat. That's the hand that I wrote with not so long ago. To be me, I had a great knack. I used to rule lands on a turtle's back. I followed orangutans. I was ingenious. Damn this rotten imbuggerance. Bugger it for being so How to do that? And I footnoted notes to the very last word, where I'm still me forever writing with birds. So I'll have another sherry. Rest my eyes. Turn the page over. Wave goodbye. Be good and be kind. Rain pulls away, my dears. Let the tears tell the tale of when I was alive as me. I used to be me. I loved being me when I used. was the incredible Lachlan O'Brien singing that rendition of I Used To Be Me. Oh, I love his voice. We look forward to um, seeing that particular project grow and develop in the future and we'll be definitely keeping an eye out for it. Obviously, over the 10 years that you've been as a musical theatre composer, you have learned certain things along the way. Um, certain, uh, you know, you've done things where you've gone, oh, I wish I could have changed that perhaps. Um, what advice have you got for up and coming musical composers? You know, people who are tuning into this podcast going, I want to, I want to learn, but you know, what's, what are some of the things that really stick out in your experience that are good advice to pass on? Do your homework, you know, pull other musicals to pieces. How do they, how do they work? How do they tell a story? What's different to, you know, how they would tell a story other than, a, like, you know, difference between film or TV? And, um, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, I can write a story and stick some songs in there. It's, it's, it's so, well, you know, Drew, how, how specific it is. Yeah. Um, you, know, don't, you know, don't just throw a song in there because you think it's time for a song, you know. Um, it's got to it's got to jump out at you, and uh, that that this is a time for a song, and and probably you know that it takes time. Be patient. Um, <laughs> yes, be very patient. <laughs> you know, try not to compare yourself to other people. You know, you see so many other of your colleagues writing stuff, and you think, why aren't I doing it? Why can't I do it? And just do your thing. And um, just keep going and be, and, and as the lesson I learned, just throw out your babies, Th throw out the things that, even things that you love that you really, that are really close to you, if they don't work, they don't work, get rid of them and you, you can use them somewhere else. But I think that's my biggest lesson that I've learned. Even though you resent the time that you spent, oh, I spent a whole week on that song and it doesn't work, you know, no, nah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have to take things personally too, because yeah. you, because as artists, our whole uh, being is, uh, you know, we feel like our integrity is 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 governed by our output, by our work that we yeah. do, and so we take things personally. 
but you can't do that. It's like you're here and your work is over there. So, you, you know, it's not, you're not the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent advice, Vicky. I, I completely agree with all of what you're saying there. I think it's excellent advice. And sometimes ourselves, it's sometimes good to go, actually, that is the advice I'm giving, but I need to take it on myself. Um, oh, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you're constantly self-analyzing, which is crazy. So, all right. So we are going to finish off this interview with a 60 second speed round. So I'm going to throw some quick questions at you and you have to answer them as quickly as you can. All right. So here we go. First musical you saw. Uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Good answer. First musical you performed in. I think that was, um, well, I played Cinderella. I played the Cinderella for Burt Newton production in the State Theatre a long time ago. Very good. A musical you think is underrated? Herringbone. Oh, um, J. Point. James Moody. J. James Moody did it. It's a solo thing. It's insane. It's just amazing. Yeah. Excellent. A musical it. you love? The Grinning Man. I saw it in London. It's a Victor Hugo story about a guy, a, a little boy who was disfigured and so he couldn't tell his true identity. It's oh. just absolutely beautiful. All right, I'm going to have to check that one out. A musical you could listen to, musical you could listen to on repeat. Oh, Into the Woods, Stephen Sondheim. Just beautiful, Good. accessible, joyful. Okay, a musical that is a guilty pleasure. <laughs> my Fair Lady. <laughs> I love My Fair Lady. It's just so beautiful. It's perfect. Story, song, everything. Beautiful. Brilliant. A musical that you want to see but haven't yet. Oh, Sunday in the Park with George. Ooh. I missed seeing it. I think it was on in Melbourne last year and I, oh, I just want to see it. So hopefully one day. Okay. Uh, instruments that you play. Oh, look, I only play piano, but as a keyboard player, I guess we have to know I play every instrument because I need to know if I'm playing a flute, I need to know how to phrase a flute or voice a guitar with chords. So, yeah, everything. <laughs> Excellent. And the last one is what is your favourite style of music to write in? Oh, I mean, twisted, dark, fantasy, gothic, weird. Oh, I love it. Twisted, dark, <laughs> fantasy, gothic, weird. Um, yeah. that, I, I don't think there's an iTunes category for that, but I love it. It's brilliant. Well, Vicky Larnack, I am so pleased to have you on with us today here on Inspiration to Stage. Where can we find out more about you and your works? Um, look, if you go to the goodomensthemusical.com, there's stuff about me. There's our bios and all that and some work from Good Omens. You can look up my music. Uh, just look up Vicky Larnack on Spotify or iTunes. You can find all my relaxation music. That's what Ooh. I did in a former life. Or follow me on Instagram, um, Vicky Larnack, or Good Omens the Musical on Instagram. Just uh, Google me and you'll find stuff. Brilliant. Well, Vicky, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on from Inspiration to Stage. And we do look very forward to what's happening with you in your composition and lyricism future and writing future. Keep, uh, everyone listening out there, keep an eye out for her new shows, for everything that's going on. And of course, check out Good Omens and follow that journey. Vicky, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Drew. It's been wonderful talking to you too. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> no worries. I trust you enjoyed that interview with the wonderful Vicky Larnack. If you would like to know more, please be sure to check out all of her social networks. And if you are a musical theatre composer and you would like a spot on our very, very special From Inspiration to Stage Spotlight podcast, please get in touch with me at fromInspirationToStage at gmail.com. That's fromInspirationToStage at gmail.com. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll catch you next time.